What will rising interest rates do to our rental markets? How do you stay positive when there's so much negative news in the media at the moment? And why invest in more affluent areas rather than the cheaper, more affordable areas? There are three questions we discuss today in the monthly question and answer podcast I run with Brett Warren. At the end of today's show, you'll have the answers to those questions plus more. So welcome to today's episode of the Michael Yardney podcast. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. I love these question and answer shows because clearly if these matters are on one person's mind, they're also going to be on the mind of others. So today I'm joined with my business partner and National Director of Metropole, Brett Warren, to answer some of your questions. Hi, Brett. Hi, Michael. Good to be with you. And yeah, look, proving to be a bit popular segment. There's obviously been a number of questions. Again, I've been left on Property Update on a website and Facebook and you know, I think it's going to appeal to a wide range of listeners. So why don't we start with the first one from Poppy B, who asks the following question. We know that falling interest rates one of the major factors stimulating the major housing boom experienced in 2021. And now interest rates are going to rise. There are concerns that this will slow the house price growth and possibly even cause a housing slump, as many people are predicting. But what effect will rising interest rates have on our rental market? And I know that's a question I'm getting at the moment from a lot of tenants and landlords are asking the same thing. So what are your thoughts, Michael? That's actually a good question, an interesting question. So while Interest rates don't directly affect rentals. There will be some indirect consequences pushing up uh, rental rates even higher. But let's just talk quickly about interest rates first, Brett. And yes, there's no doubt that falling interest rates stimulated the housing market, made it uh, easier to buy homes, get people had bigger budgets. But we've spoken often, and people who are watching my regular videos with Andrew Wilson know that rising interest rates don't necessarily crash the housing market, and the Reserve Bank doesn't want that to happen. It seems now with inflation picking up faster than expected, the Reserve Bank's going to raise interest rates sooner than initially anticipated. But if it's smart and sensible, it's only going to do it gently because it's still wanting to create the wealth effect. It's wanting people to have a feeling of comfort and security in their homes. So I can't see rising interest rates doing a lot of damage to house prices. But um, let's talk about the rentals, which I guess was Poppy's question. And currently, we know, Brett, Australia's facing a rental crisis as vacancy rates have dropped to the lowest point on record with around Australia in general vacancy rates being around 2%. I know that your office in in, in Brisbane, uh, there's a queue of people every time we've got a property up for rent. Yeah, very, very popular, the girls at the moment in, the, in property management, absolutely. Sure. So, Rents for detached houses, they've risen as much as 15% over the last 12 months as vacancy rates have kept falling for houses in particular, but also now for apartments. And moving forward, now their international borders are open. They have been open for a while. There are no statistics yet, but this is going to put additional strain on what's already a tight rental market. And this is going to push rents up even higher. There's no place for all these people to, to live. The influx of migrants is most likely going to initially hit Sydney and Melbourne in particular, but also a bit in Brisbane, but they're the most popular destinations for international migrants. So while interest rates drive house price growths and slumps, the main driver for rentals really, Poppy, is vacancy rates, which is really a measure of supply and demand of rentals. In other words, landlords can't put up their rentals just because their holding costs go up, because interest rates go up, because their taxes go up. What they have to do is see what the rental market can afford. And if tenants are given a steep rental increase, or if they used to in the old days, all they do is, well, they'd move. I mean, there's there's a cost in moving. There's the emotional cost in moving. But tenants just simply find another cheaper, comparable property elsewhere. So it's often said that 3% is the the balance in the rental market where uh, it's not neither a landlord's or a 
tennis market, but I actually don't agree with that anymore, Brett. I think it's closer to now in this digital economy, a vacancy rate of 2% is more appropriate as a balanced market. See, what, what, what I've found is once local vacancy rates move above 3% and remain elevated for a while, rents fall, and they have in various segments, particularly the apartment markets in Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane. What happens is rents fall because landlords drop their rent to, to attract tenants because the vacancy rate's high. On the other hand, rents tend not to rise until the vacancy rate falls below around 2%. And then all of a sudden, tenants have got to compete. They put landlords in a better position to increase rents. And I know at property management in Melbourne, in Sydney and Brisbane, we've actually found with a queue of tenants, despite us pushing rents up and making sure our landlords get the best market rent available, sometimes tenants even offer more to get ahead of the queue because there is such a vacancy. Of course, the side effect of rising interest rates means that potential home buyers are going to have more difficulty getting loans. Young first home buyers start in the rental market. All of a sudden, their rents have gone up. The cost of living has gone up. The cost of petrol has gone up. And that puts extra pressure on the rental markets because they're not going to move. So I can see this next year moving forward, Brett, a year of a rental crisis, a year of rising rents, and all it's really doing is playing catch up because rents were stagnant for a while, weren't they? Yeah, look, certainly were. And I think that's a really good point to make with regards to interest rates. It's more about the vacancy rates and the supply and demand. So I think you've um, you've done well there to answer Poppy's question. I've got another one here from Henry L. Thanks to the great podcast and daily blogs, Michael. I love your enthusiasm and your upbeat tone, but how can I stay positive and take a long-term perspective when all the news is so negative? And Michael, I've often talked to you about this before and it's something that I'm sure our listeners listen in for that um that realism and the the optimism that you that you offer so yeah what's the secret okay that's interesting and thank you for the question Henry that you left on property update and for listeners here who want to leave their questions just leave it on any of the comments in property update that Brett and I check on a daily basis or on our websites any of the articles on property update there's always comments section there we got to remember that it's not the media's job to educate us. It's their job to get our eyeballs on the website on pages that their advertisers are already paid to appear on. Therefore, they tend to have clickbait headlines. They have negative news. So I can understand Henry's concern, but I think it's important to recognise that the media is not the friend of of the disciplined, of the patient investor. Uh, Ignoring the key determinants of lifetime investor returns, the media prefers instead to focus on short-term returns, the next hotspot, the market predictions, the negative news, not the way you and I try to I guess, direct our clients. No, look, there's some interesting points there. You know, obviously going back to the the old days, Michael, when uh, we used to read newspapers and I can remember getting my newspaper delivered and and sitting there reading the newspaper and, and, you know, looking through things and having a a half an hour, an hour to go through it. But nowadays you've probably got about two or three minutes the way people are scrolling through things and looking at things. So it's really important that they do capture your attention with the, the best headline possible. And I think, obviously, a lot of these journalists these days are quite young. They're quite inexperienced. They don't have the ability to educate. So I think that that dynamic has really changed. And it's it's really about capturing your eyeballs. And at the end of the day, there's advertising, advertising space for sale. And, you know, news outlets have to really catch our attention in a few seconds, don't they? They do, very much so. And the life cycle of news is much, much quicker. You're right compared to the old days of the magazines that we used to sit down and read or the newspapers. So to answer Henry's question, really, the comment is you are continuously being bombarded by this sort of information. So it is difficult. But it's also, I guess, therefore important to be careful who you listen to and only rely on, I guess, proven and trusted providers of property market information that give long-term perspectives. And sure, we believe we are offering that here, but we're not the only ones. There are other very good podcasts and there are other very good commentators and there are some good commentators in the news media as well, but but they're few and far between. It's, of course, important to understand that everybody else has got an opinion on property as well, but that doesn't necessarily mean, though, that you're going to get the right advice. So be careful of your family and friends and what others tell you. I know over Easter, somebody probably sat down with you and you know, Uncle Harry told you that he bought an investment property in 1980 and it didn't do well. So only listen to people who've already achieved what you want to achieve, Henry, rather than 
that large group of people who unfortunately haven't achieved what they wanted to. You called me an optimist a while ago, Brett, and I've got an optimistic outlook, I know. I hope I'm realistic. But in general, in the media, property optimists sound like reckless cheerleaders, while a pessimist tends to sound like somebody with a sharp mind who's dug past the headlines. The media almost twists things around and makes pessimists sound right and optimists sound wrong. So it's important to remember the long-term trend of our property markets always been going up over the over the hundred years since Federation. And this has been interrupted by multiple short-term downturns. So are we going to get another downturn? Of course we are. But it's just the way the cycle works. But the property market's too illiquid to play these trends. So rather than the share market, investors should really be looking at the long-term upward trend and not be surprised when the market stalls, not be surprised when it fatlines, not be surprised when it drops a little bit in certain locations and not make their investment decisions based on the last 30 minutes or even the last 30 days of news. But for reasons I've never really understood, many people like to hear the world's going to go to hell. They, 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 they want to hear the property market's going to crash. It's hard to argue. Despite the record of things getting better for most people most of the time, pessimism isn't just more common than optimism, but it seems to sound smarter than optimism, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It it seems to sound, if you're pessimistic, I'm intellectually captivating and people pay more attention to pessimists than optimists. But it's always been that way. I, I remember reading a while ago, somebody called John Stuart Mill wrote 150 years ago, he said, I've observed that not the man who hopes when others despair, but the man who despairs when other hopes is admired by a large class of persons as a sage. I observe that not the man who hopes when others despair, but he who despairs when other hopes is admired by a large class of persons as a sage. So, Brett, in other words, if you say the world has been getting better. You may get away with being called naive and insensitive, but if you say the world's going to keep getting better, you're considered embarrassingly mad. On the other hand, it seems like if you're going to say a catastrophe is imminent, you may be called a genius, Brett, or you may even be given a Nobel Peace Prize. Well, we do know a few people like that who have, um, you know, <laughs> I guess in the past come and, and predicted every couple of years that the world's going to end, and they certainly get a lot of headlines, don't they, Michael? Well, in fact, the most downloaded podcasts every year are my yearly chat with Robert Kiyosaki that I have, and then we're we, with uh, Harry Dent, who again were wrong, weren't they? But it's almost that time of the year again, so I think I'm going to approach them and he, see what they've actually got to say, because boy, they got a lot of attention last year, didn't they? Well, it's always coming, Michael, isn't it? And what they say, even a broken clock's right twice a day, so yeah, eventually, eventually they'll get it right. I guess there's another couple of reasons why I've observed why pessimists don't get so much attention. Optimists appear oblivious to risk. So by default, pessimism, I think it actually looks more intelligent, but it's the wrong way to view optimists in my mind. To me, most optimists will tell you things will get ugly, that we're going to have recessions, that we're going to have bear markets, that we're going to have wars, panics and pandemics. But despite that, they remain optimistic because they set themselves up in their in their property portfolios, in their careers, uh, in their disposition to endure the downsides. To the pessimists, the bad events, the, that's the end of the story. Yet to optimists, it's a sl- just a chapter, a chapter in an otherwise excellent book. The difference between an optimist and a pessimist comes down to your endurance, your resilience, your time frame, doesn't it, Brett? I really like that one. Um to the pessimist, the bad event is the end of the story. To an optimist, it's just part of the journey. I, I think that's really powerful. It is. Pessimists show that not everything's moving in the right direction, which helps you. It helps them, I guess, rationalise the shortcomings that we all have. Yeah, what's that old saying? Misery loves company. Realising that things are out of your control can uh, be. I guess it gives you a level of comfort. Well, it's not my fault. Uh, uh, Pessimists blame everyone else rather than themselves. They feel like they're a passenger going along in the journey rather than the pilot of their lives. Yeah, look, Michael, pessimism requires action as well, whereas optimism means staying the course. And, you know, the old sell it, get out and run, which grabs your attention because it's an action you need to take right now, whereas optimism is more about it. Don't worry about it. Stay the course. You know, we'll be right. And getting back to what you said before, it's just part of the journey, isn't it? It is very much so. That's a really good point. So sometimes the right thing to do is nothing. 
But that's hard to do when all the news is negative around you. So while optimism sounds like a sales pitch and pessimism sounds like uh, somebody's trying to help you, that's not necessarily the case. So I guess I've never come across a wealthy, a really successful pessimist. In fact, in general, optimists are more successful, Brett. Yeah, absolutely. I think you have to be in it. It takes my mind back to a blog post I probably wrote um, pre-coronavirus, Michael, about the best $2 investment that you could make. And it it got to do with, uh, obviously, your earplugs. But I think, you know, it's really important that, I guess, to take you away from the everyday events and the chapters in life, it's to actually have a long-term plan and, and actually understand what your end goal is and have a series of framework and structures in place, treat your portfolio like a business so you can check in every 12 months to make sure you're on track. So that way, it's actually part of that journey we talked about, not just part of the end. I think that's really a good point, Brett. So if you have a plan, then you stick to it. If you don't have a plan, it's just too easy to get caught up in the hype and do what everyone else is doing. Yeah, and, you know, you check in, you can see the results, you can see that you've actually been making progress. You know, I think a lot of investors, I guess we call it a buy and hope strategy or, you know, in some cases a buy and pray strategy. And it's so easy to get sidetracked by the latest headline or the latest doom and gloom or the latest hotspot or what may or may not happen. But you know, a lot of our more strategic investors and successful investors, they understand it's a long-term journey. It takes a long time to create wealth. And they're focusing on building wealth and creating wealth for them and their family over the longer term, rather than checking in and out of the market and trying to make a once-off profit um, mm. each and every time. Sure. You're right, Brett. You can't expect a top return from a secondary property. I think one more piece of advice for those trying to sort out all this conflicting message in the media, when you start to study a field, it seems like you've got to understand a zillion things, but in fact you don't. What you need to do is identify the core principles could be three or four, often there's probably a dozen with property that govern that field. And the million things you thought you'd had to understand and memorize are simply a combination of all those core principles. In property, these are the things that we discuss regularly on this show, things that actually create wealth through property. We talk a bit about uh, the drivers of the long-term property values, demographics, consumer confidence, the increasing population in our economy. So it's important to understand all those factors as well and not be sidetracked by all the little bits of news. I think that's a really good point, Michael. And I think one thing you always say to me is, uh, you know, if you're the smartest person in your team, you're in trouble. So you don't actually have to know all of this. You just have to know the experts in their field. And you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's going to take you a long, long time to get to a level of experience that someone's got 10 or 20 years. So it's much easier to, what do you say, Michael? Um, you can't beat experience, but you can hire it. That's a really good point. So I guess you've got to understand the right questions to ask. And that's why it's important to keep educating yourself, to listen to podcasts, to buy books, to keep up to date. Terrific, Michael. Well, the last question I'd like to discuss today has been left by Rowan, Rowan M, who asks, many advisors tell you to buy properties in the median price range or affordable properties below the median. Michael, you seem to buy more expensive properties, but this isn't always easy. Why don't you like cheap properties? Hey, that's a good question. And again, it goes back to what I said a minute ago, that you can't expect first-class results from secondary properties. So you've got to buy quality property. We've gone through often what a quality property is, but maybe we should just go back a step and say that most advisors get paid to tell you to buy a property. They don't get paid to tell you to hold on to your current property or to wait till the opportunity is right or till you're financially ready. They don't get paid to tell you to sell a property because they don't make anything out of it. Uh, And sometimes that's the right answer. So I know, Brett, that's really why, first of all, you and your team start off by putting a strategy together for clients. Absolutely. Really important to understand that long-term goal because then we can actually come back and you've actually got a destination. It's it's almost like you're, you're going on holiday. You, you don't just rock up to the airport and hope you get on a plane to Hawaii. Um, it's all planned out. You know where you need to be in the timeframes. And I think that's critically important. So part of the plan involves an asset accumulation plan. There's various subsections to the plan, but first of all, you've got to, depends what stage of the journey you're on, but you've got got to build an asset base. And to build an asset base, you've got to leverage, you've got to borrow, you've got to gear, and you've got to invest for capital growth. It's easier to invest for capital growth. And then later down the track, you can buy cash flow once you've built a substantial asset base. And you're going to get better capital growth from the 
better quality, higher value assets. The first asset, all your assets really should be A grade. And if you can, we often suggest you start in Sydney or Melbourne, the more expensive capital cities. And if you can't afford an A grade asset in Sydney, buy an A grade asset in Melbourne. If you can't buy in Melbourne, in Brisbane, rather than a B grade asset elsewhere, because your future financial freedom is going to depend upon the quality of the asset base you've got. So even if they, you can buy something that's cheap at the moment, that will probably stop you developing substantial wealth in the future. If one looks back at the history of properties, some have outperformed others by 50, even 100%. And a lot of it has to do with the location of the property. And that's where the cost is, really, isn't it? So affordability is going to constrain property prices. So we need to buy in areas where people are going to be able to pay more, be prepared to pay more, be prepared to pay more rent. So Rowan, the answer is, I don't invest in the lower socioeconomic areas, not because of the judging of the people that are there. But over the last year, last two years, properties have gone up 20%, sometimes 30%, and wages hardly have at all overall. In other words, it means that in the lower socioeconomic areas where wages have gone up minimally, affordability is going to max out and there's no way property values are going to increase much there moving forward. While in the more affluent areas, there's people who've actually got uh, multiple streams of income and Brett, it's actually not just the owner-occupiers who are buying properties near you. It's also the tenants, isn't it? Yeah, it's absolutely crucial, you know, to have those rising incomes above average incomes. You know, our income, our inflation rate's been quite low, and as a result, people's incomes haven't grown as fast. So I think that's incredibly important. It's also important to invest where there is a lot more owner-occupiers because there will be a shortage of, you know, tenant properties and things like that as well. And you know. I guess in a lot of those more established locations, a lot of those more, you know, um, higher end locations, I think we looked at the statistics, Michael, probably only you know, a third of people don't even have a mortgage in those areas. So that eliminates a lot of mortgage stress and a lot of volat- volatility and things like that. And the other thing, Michael, is like you said, you know, your, your future income and prosperity is tied to your, your tenants' growth, their ability to pay rent and pay higher rent. So it's incredibly important you find those tenants who can sustain higher rental payments and higher rental growth. Sure, because not all tenants are tenants because they can't afford to buy. They're often renting in these more affluent areas so they can be in near school zones or because of lifestyle or because of the stage of life they're at at the moment. So I think one of the biggest fears of property investors is vacancies, not having a tenant, not paying somebody to help sustain your mortgage. One way of preventing this is by owning the type of property which is going to be in strong demand by the more affluent people, but in a location where there are not as many tenants, but more owner occupiers. It costs the same to get a plumber to fix a property uh, that's more expensive than a cheaper one as well. So I actually like buying the more expensive properties because they're going to be in stronger demand by this demographic we talked about. They're going to have more capital growth. And you're not going to be able to replace your income with the type of cash flow you get from cheap properties. Regional properties, sure, in the beginning, they're high yielding, but that's because the capital growth is low, meaning over the long run, they are expensive to hold on to because they're not going to get you to get your goals. They're not really cheap. They're cheap today. But despite more of us moving a little bit to regional towns, regional towns really have limited economic growth, Brett. I think you always say, Michael, you know, follow the big trends, the major trends. There's always going to be people shifting here and there, but the majority of people are still going to be grouped around those bigger employment hubs. And that's where you're going to experience higher economic growth, higher wages growth, um, and a a superior range of tenants. Sure. So if you can't afford a house, then have a look at a townhouse. If you can't afford a townhouse, have a look at an apartment. Apartments currently uh, the gap between the price of apartments and houses is the biggest it's been for a long time. You know, it's a lot of it's related just to the way people have moved living differently over COVID. But the next round of apartments, we're not building enough, are going to cost a lot more, which means the gap's going to uh, now get closer between houses and apartments, bringing up the value of apartments, established apartments now. So in the right locations, apartments still make good investments, but not just any apartment, not high-rise apartments family-friendly apartments. But again, get the best location you can, Rowan, and if you can afford to get the most expensive. Now, 
a while ago I did a show, Brett, on monopoly. I used the analogy of monopoly. Um, and there are different types of property. And everyone wants to own the expensive properties in monopoly. You know, Park Lane and Mayfair or Bond Street. No one wants to own the cheap properties. Brett, no one wins monopoly owning Old Kent Road. <laughs> and while you may not be able to own the most expensive properties in the discretionary locations, the next step then is buy in the the ripple effect, the gentrifying locations, aspirational suburbs, that you're going to rely not just on the market doing the heavy lifting, but also take advantage of the local gentrification. Because moving forward, we know that after this year, the market's probably going to slow down and there's not going to be the strong growth. But if you could count on either gentrification or manufacturing capital growth, adding value, that would help as well. Uh, so to answer Rowan's question, there's lots of reasons why I wouldn't buy in the lower price bracket, the affordable price bracket, because in general, cheap properties will always be cheap. They're never going to move Penrith close to Darling Harbour. They're never going to uh, move Cranbourne close to the Bay in Melbourne. Uh, the more affluent locations are where more and more people are going to want to and afford to live, but they're just built out. Yeah. Now, excellent point, Michael. Well, that's all my questions for today. So I think we've got through a fair few there and um, hopefully we've answered everyone's question in a great level of detail. So it's interesting, Brett, that as we're moving through this stage of the property cycle, I can see a lot of people becoming a bit more nervous at the moment. They're being anxious. Like some of those questions there about the media, is it the right time? There's the political problems overseas. There's an election. Uh, there's rising interest rates. There's talk about the property market falling. And so it's easy for people to say, hey, I'm just going to wait and see. But I know that when we went through similar situations two years ago at the beginning of COVID when people sat and waited and seen or, or other times as well, those who actually set themselves up, got themselves organised, got themselves prepared, when the picture became clearer, uh, they were in a fantastic position to take advantage of the market. Look, it's a really interesting thing that we have at the moment, Michael, with a lot of our portfolio reviews because we're talking to people who invested 12 or 18 months ago when the world was going to end, we were going to lose 50% of our house prices, but they did position themselves. They got themselves ready. They understood that whatever happened in the next 6 or 12 months was not going to affect their portfolios in the next 10, 15, 20 years, and they took action. And a lot of them have been rewarded with 30%, 40% plus in a 12-month period, which is quite incredible. So... You know, my advice, as I said before, is no one knows what's going to happen next. That's the reality of this situation. So I think it's a really good time to actually put a plan in place, to actually understand where you want to be and what your end goals are and, and how you want that to look, and then come back to where we are now and, and allow for these types of things and, and um, you know, put that in place and, and block the noise out and, and just I always think the right time to invest, Michael, is, is when you're ready, not, not when others tell you to. That's a good point. So a moment ago, we spoke about how many advisors are paid to help you or advise you to buy or sell, and they don't get paid if they don't. That's actually not the way Metropole works, and that's, I think, one of the reasons of our success in helping clients. So our uh, advice is independent, we believe, or we genuinely believe, and unbiased. And it always starts by putting a plan together. Uh, and we're shamelessly committed to making your investment life as boring as possible so the rest of your life's exciting. So I must suggest whether you're just starting off as an investor or wanting to grow your existing portfolio, why not have a chat with Brett and my team? We offer our clients a time-tested system. We've got a proven track record. We've been involved in more than $4.5 billion worth of property transactions. And while our property strategists don't care if you invest in Melbourne, Sydney, Britain, wherever – we have on the ground experience if we are then going to go ahead and advise you to use our buyers agent services. Our teams are on the ground and know what's happening in the local markets. And Brett, we've actually never sold a property, yet we've got access to every property on the market. I think that's a very important point because a lot of people come to us thinking we're trying to sell them a property, but that's at this point in time, I don't, I, it's the last thing we, we will do. Um, I think rather than finding a property and work, making everything work out, let's look at your risk profile, your budget, your comfort level, and then find an asset that fits in with that. And look, if you want to wait until you find out what the election is or you want to wait until what happens in Russia plays out, that's fine. But I think it's a great time to actually put a plan in place and get an understanding of where you are, and then you can actually make a more educated decision. Sure. So we help our clients fix their 
problems because a lot come with issues that got to be sorted out before they move next. We help avoid problems because we've seen the landmines, we've seen the potholes, and we help get uh, better returns, outperform the averages. And I know we proudly say, Brett, that a couple of years ago, our clients were audited and we found that our clients were 7.3 times more likely to own six or more properties than the average property investor. So if you want to find out more about our services or have a chat with Brett Warren personally directly, go to metropole.com.au, find out about what we do. Of course, there'll be a link in the show notes, but you'd know about Metropole by now. And we'd love to be part of your wealth creation journey. Thanks, Michael. It was great to chat to you. And again, you know, more than welcome to sit down with myself and, and talk in a bit more detail about your portfolio so we can make an educated decision moving forward. So thanks again for your time. My pleasure, Brett. That was great. We'll catch up again next month for the next question and answer session. And again, if you've got a question you'd like Brett or me or one of the other experts to answer, just go to Property Update and leave a comment in any of the blogs. We read them. We'll answer them sometimes online on the blog or If it's a good enough question, we'll share it here. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, Michael. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. In my mindset message today, I'd like to talk with you about the seeds of success. Now, you've probably heard the old Chinese proverb, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, and the second best time is now. Now, In my book, Rich Habits, Poor Habits, my co-author Tom Corley talks about his rich habits study where he studied the habits of the wealthy people and compared them to the average person. And he found that almost every one of the self-made millionaires in his rich habits study pursued their dreams despite the fact that they weren't ready. It didn't matter that they didn't know what they were doing. It didn't matter that they didn't have enough money. It didn't matter that no one on the ground believed in them. So a self-made millionaire is just hardwired to be courageous? Are they just hardwired to have greater confidence? Are they hardwired with greater intelligence? Well, Tom Corley says, no, no, they're not. They simply have a stronger passion for some dream, and that passion produces a very powerful type of energy that Tom calls emotional energy. Emotional energy enables dreamers to take action every day on their dream. Taking action enables them to learn, to figure out what to do figure out what not to do and that learning helps them grow in their knowledge and grows their confidence which further stimulates them to continue to take action on their dream. Tom Corley believes that within the DNA of every human being are seeds of success. Unfortunately for most individuals these seeds of success remain dormant their entire lives but what brings about these seeds of success to life is the pursuit of a dream and goals The goal is behind that dream. The pursuit of the dream is the key to unleashing your inner success traits. So when you pursue a dream, you germinate those seeds of success that exist within inside you. What are the seeds of success? Well, Tom Corley says their courage, their confidence, their intelligence, their persistence, their single-minded focus, enthusiasm, motivation, mental agility, mental endurance, resilience, attention to detail, and hard work ethic. Interesting, isn't it? So, passion in pursuit of a dream is the water, the sunshine and the soil that brings to life and nourishes these seeds of success in you. Well, that was another one of our monthly question and answer podcast sessions I have with Brett Warren. If you got some benefit from it and you know somebody else who'd also benefit from the information we shared, please tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. You'll be doing them a favour, but you'll also be doing me a favour in my quest to make as many people as financially literate as possible. I'll be back again real soon, but you can catch me on social media in the meantime. Of course, my private Facebook group's a place where I leave some information, some tips, some charts every day. Go to Facebook and look for the Property Update private Facebook group. I'll be back again real soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect, and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney podcast. 
Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you? 